presentations. Um, I'm not going to say anything about Pat. Um, <laughs> Margaret Warren. Good. Margaret was kidnapped into a family of award-winning artists. Yeah. She first began breaking cameras at age three. <laughs> By age 12, she had won awards and had published in newspapers. Her arti artistic pursuits expanded <laughs> in range, and she began showing and selling her work in watercolor, pen, and ink. After a vigorous foray into cryptology, yes, cryptology, she developed a professional career in the computing sciences applied to art. She has owned and operated her own multimedia and computing consulting company, Karma, with a C, it's a pun, productions for over 15 years. Karma provides photographic lab services, electronics, and audio engineering. In 2002, Margaret began showing her art regularly in local and regional venues along the Gulf Coast, including the Pensacola Museum of Art. She has won many awards and juried shows. Most recently, she has been touring her Porsche Junkyard series at Porsche events all over the country, and pieces from that work are now in collections in the U.S., Sweden, and Netherlands. There's also uh, one of her pieces in our library. In 2007, she placed first in the Porsche Club of America Porsche Parade Art Show in the professional division. Her own art car is a hand-painted 1965 Porsche 356 Coupe uh, and it won third prize at the Houston National Art Car Parade in 2009. It is a colorful, abstract, neo, semi, hemi, demi, expressionist, psychedelicist rendering of art cars of the late 1960s. <laughs> also in 2009, Margaret was invited to serve as a voting committee member for the Art in State program to select art for the new Science and Technology Building up at UWF. Over the past few years, she has been engaged in collaborative research project with Patrick Hayes, Involve, hmm? uh, I, I interfered with their work significantly. Involving contemporary art and the semantic web. And this is the topic of their talk today. Semi-logical, hemi-popularist, expressionistic, formalistic, pragmatist, post-classicistic, neo-Hegelian ontology. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Margaret Warren. Thank you. Except that Pat's going to start this. Except that Pat is going to begin this well, talk. I'll start this. I You're going to start. Maybe we not work with these. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go. <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. Oh well. So I'm going to set the context for our work. Um, linked data, linked image data. First of all, what does linked data mean? Now, I think many of you will have heard this. It's a current buzzword in the world of the semantic web. Um, it's the latest manifestation of the semantic web idea, and the one that's getting probably the most energy at the moment. Um, the idea is to use RDF, which stands for Resource Description Format, which is a, a standardized formalism for encoding machine-readable knowledge on the, on the World Wide Web, for those of you who don't know that. Um, to use that to create a web of semantic links between data items. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of data out on the web, and I don't just mean web pages. I mean databases, lists of cities, uh, airport codes, vast amounts of machine-readable, organized information in structured form. Um, the idea is to take it, 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 the idea of linked data is to make links between those data items. And the meanings of those links are described by what we call lightweight ontologies. Ontology is just an organized system of concepts that is uh, usable by machines to draw conclusions and make connections. And the idea here is to have the, is the emphasis is on lightweight. And we'll be seeing that again and again. Next slide. So, currently, or with, with con what is now considered conventional data technology, data is basically in silos. It, it's, there's huge amounts of data organized in a database or a, a knowledge base or some such system, usually with a, some sort of internal coding that's proprietary or local to that particular system and in which a lot of money and energy has been invested. And you access it through an API, a programming interface or a query language or some such thing, in which you ask the system, do you know this? Or what do you know about this topic or whatever? And the system does its internal stuff and comes back with the answer and sends it back to you. That, that exists. What, we wanted, what linked data wants to do is to basically get away from that picture and replace it with this picture in which the links are between not the silos, not the huge, large scale things, but between the individual data items in the silos and linked directly to other data items. 
And a link here is not just a pointer, not just an address, but an address plus a short description that, in, that describes the relationship between the data items or between the items that the data is about. Next slide. <coughs> so here's a little example, a tiny example from a project which has started off as a sort of basically a, in a, a, a three people having this idea in a back room uh, and is now one of the world's largest such uh, repositories called FOAF. So that's a friend of a friend. So FAF is a vocabulary and a set of conventions that you can, if you type FAF into Google, it will find it for you, that lets you put a little bit of information on your website that links to other people who are your friends, that you declare to your friends, to pictures of you, to information about where you live, any information you want, to your mailbox, to your home page. And those links can be followed by, by computers and, and utilized. So a great web of connection between people has been set up. So you see these, and remind the sort of messy syntax if it makes your eyes go blink. But um, this is a, an, a crypt, um, what's the word? Um, encoded. encoded. Um, mailbox. A ha yeah, a, a secret hash that, that links to someone's mailbox. And the shas of one sum is an indication to the machine of what kind of decoding to use on it. Um, so this is essentially a link to a something that's actually the, the mailbox belonging to who? A person called uh, Dan Bree, who's just actually Dan Brinkley. And this is um, the URI, the, the link to his, um, to, to actually him, in his FOAF record. So this is the kind of way in which these, these, uh, these things come about. A little chunk of information, readable chiefly by computers, using, and we said lightweight ontology, using this notion of, these are the, the, like, the elements of the ontology in this case, knowing. This person knows that person. This is thing is that person's mailbox. This thing is this is that person's name. These see also is a sort of generalized label on a link, meaning, well, that's got some more information over there. Okay, here's Tim Bern a bit of Tim Berners-Lee's uh, uh, personal card. Anyway, next slide. Uh, writing these lightweight ontologies, uh, emphasis on lightweight, is an art, not a science. Well, writing any ontology is an art, really, but especially these. Because this is a new idea. Ontologies, as they're often called, have been around for a while now, and they tend to be thought of as kind of heavyweight, big things that, you know, international agreements are made on. This, the, the idea here is something that can be used by ordinary people to make these links very easily. They have to be small. Whoa. Sorry. Oh. I <laughs> thought something might happen there. <laughs> God bless Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> And therefore, they have to be sort of minimal. And they're often very sort of underdefined, and deliberately so. So FAR, for example, defines a class of people. And it defines it as being the class of people. That's the definition. You know, no analysis given at all. It's almost a joke. Agent is another class it has. And this definition of agent is, I think, things that make stuff happen. That's actually the documentation of the term agent in the FAF uh, homepage. And it's deliberately written in a sort of folksy way. I was kind of like poke your finger out at philosophers kind of thing. So it's saying, look, we can't define that. But what it can say, and it says this in a way that's a readable machine, is that, well, whatever the people are, they're a subclass of the agents. So every person is an agent. And there also might be other agents as well. And in fact, there are. On, on the computer. So this kind of minimal kind of relationship between rather fuzzily defined classes is the sort of style that, that you, said you tend to see in, in these lightweight ontologies. And there's a whole lot of kind of, you might sort of folklore, sort of style of good form things to do. You try and reuse relations and classes that have been defined by others instead of defining your own if you can. Um, and uh, by and large, the meaning of things is understood to be specified by the actual way they get used. So the, sort of, the part of the documentation is supposed to be giving advice to people out there when they write up their links and create their link data, so try and use it in this kind of a way. Okay, next. This is not just an idea, this is really happening. Uh, this is a diagram often reproduced in this, uh, it's ver it, it keeps getting changed. This is March 2009, which is the most recent one we could find, of, of, exam of chunks of, of data that, that have been linked in this way. I'll give you an idea, this is the US Census data, that's huge. DBpedia is um, Wikipedia transcribed into machine readable form, all of it. That's, I forget the total size of this, but it's in the many, many millions of data items. Um, there's a lot, and, and there, this is now being added to it, by the way, uh, just bit, since this was done, um, the Library of Congress has put its entire catalog into linked data form. 
Um, so there are now, let's see, as of November 2009, 13.1 billion RDF triples are estimated to be linked in this way. And the number's growing every week, every day. Um, okay. So that's linked data. What about linked image data? Well, now there are images in the linked data world, but they're almost all illustrations. So on the FOAF, in the Friend of a Friend project, people will link to a picture of them. So here's my picture. <laughs> okay. You know, you can see my portrait on the, on the, on the link site. We're interested in, Margaret and I have always been interested in images in their own right. Images as, you know, works of art, for example. Um, and the images are not just illustrations of something else. They actually are the topic. So we're trying to sort of put images as first-class entities on the, on, the, on the linked data world. Now, there's been, as these are actual document covers I've put there for illustration, there's been a number of pieces of work done by the W3C and many other organizations, actually mostly W3C, on image annotation, the semantic web, media fragments, that means little snippets of video or stills from video, so it's still images. Um, but these have, none of these have really had the same focus that we've wanted. Um, they focus typically on, in this case, on the things that the images are images of. If you're interested in finding a picture of the Prime Minister of Uzbekistan or something, then, then that's the ontology for you. Um, so it, it, it's really about, the, about the, the, the people and things in the images, for, for, like, for example, finding news, cat, news catalogs. And then others have been really designed by museum curators for sort of doing curation and cataloging of, of artwork rather than describing the artwork itself. So we, we want to find out what the what we'll be able to capture, what image makers themselves say about their images. Next, and I, I think, think this, this is you. Me. Well, I, I, yeah, I think what Pat was saying is there's a lot of work that's been done out there already, of course, you can see by that large diagram, and some people have talked about images, so you would wonder where is the spot for us. But basically, what has been done amounts to about this already, which is just that there are things and images that are depicted and, and that's about it. So, um, may, you know, that's just not sufficient. I came to Pat some years ago because I have a large catalog of images that I wanted to be able to describe for the web and just doing simple tagging is not enough. And this is basically still sticking with this, the simple tagging. So um, we might ask ourselves these questions. Well, when we began working, we started with using CMAP tools. And I sat down and, and did about uh, at least a dozen of these. And we also went to other artists. We've been out in the community since I participate a lot with the art community here. And we started trying to look at what all kinds of knowledge we would want to say about a piece of art. This is not a snapshot. And this is the image that's out in the library, by the way. So, um, um, so there's a big gap between what we want to say, which, and this is obviously very difficult to formalize, versus what, um, what is being done right now in the linked image data world. So, so we started out with a simple image. We, we, and this is a simple snapshot. This is not a snapshot that we, that we, I would ever want to do anything with. I, you know, it's just, but it does have some, uh, some interesting information and it, someone might want to see it at some point in time. But you can see, uh, here's a list basically, kind of a grocery list of what's being depicted. Now, one of the ontologies that's out there already that depicts uh, topics that are related to journalism, for example, it attempts to have a class for like every type of depictable thing there is. There's a class of, of important heads of state, and there's a class of of um, I don't know opening rail, event, railroad event, cars events, and events to do with opening thousands. of some institution. It, yeah. It, right. yeah, I mean every single event has a class associated with it. Well, that's a little that's 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 a heavyweight ontology. We don't want to do that, but we started saying, well, is there something else that we can say? We know there's got to be something else we can say, and here's a re here's one reason why. Somewhere in this image is JFK. I mean, he really is really actually right here. But here in the corner. But 
is this, but there's a lot more depicted in this picture than just JFK, and yet the subject of it, for journalism purposes, would be JFK. So there's a, there's a difference here between if you were going to list everything that were depicted in this image, it's, this is not the primary subject. So there's obviously some division here of more that you can say about an image for the web. So this is where... just say, that, that image, in case you didn't notice, that, that, came, that was in the news about a month ago. Yeah. Someone found this image. They'd had right. it all these years in their attic. Right. And it, it shows JFK cavorting with nude girls, yes. which would have been a huge scandal at the time. At the time. But is now simply of, oh, how about that, of uh. historical interest? Who would have thought it? Yeah, who are they? <laughs> <laughs> so... I spent a lot of time sitting around talking about images, and and, and we um, it, and once we got past Pat saying every five minutes, it's not in the image; it's in the scene. <laughs> Meaning, you know, obviously that the, the item itself is not actually inside of an image. Um, I, I have this the, bee in my bonnet. I, I, every time I'm driving and I look at that little mirror, and it has printed on the glass. Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. And every time I read it, I think, idiot, the object is not in the mirror. <laughs> it's, it's, depicted. it's depicted in the scene that the mirror Exactly. Reflects. Why didn't they say right. that on the mirror? Oh, okay. <laughs> so we got, to this, we got to this wonderful breaking point here where we said, okay, well, what does this depict? And I'm saying, well, it depicts diamonds. And Pat's like, no, it depicts nothing. And I said, wait a minute, it, it, it depicts diamonds. So we went back and forth and back and forth. So, so I said, okay, let's just go on this premise that Pat might be right. And let's just, <laughs> let's just, <laughs> let's just, like, exactly. <laughs> so it goes downhill from there. No. And so then, <laughs> so we said, okay, all right, so this depicts nothing. But what it does have in it are pictorial elements. And uh, here's another one, for, and here's a more famous one. Uh, by the way, that previous picture is a painting of Pat's, so uh, on his wall in his, in his family room. So, um, But this one is a little bit more famous example, a Pollock. And um, this also depicts nothing, and I'm sure Pollock would agree with that. Um, but it does have a lot of... Um, a lot of what we would call pictorial elements. So we started doing some more research on this pictorial elements idea. And um, we, we took one of my photographs, and here's one that I would have a really difficult time describing because what's depicted in this picture is literally an egg, a test tube, a transparent layer of another photograph, and a piece of jewelry. <laughs> so that's what was actually literally depicted in this image. But what I want to say about it is that it's got some shapes in it, like here's a shape that I think looks like a female torso. Here's a shape that looks like a brain, and here's a shape of that looks like the torso is sitting aside, astride a seat of some sort. So I call this picture surfing with psyche. Um, but um, basically, to get back to the point, just to reiterate the point once again, because you all may not see all these things like I do, I'm the artist, is that, again, we get back to the point that what we're trying to capture is what image, what image makers themselves say about their work. And that, or someone who has an interest in wanting to mark up the work. It doesn't necessarily have to be the image maker themselves. So we, we um, started thinking about this idea of pictorial elements uh, more closely. And naturally, if, in art, these, you know, there are these pictorial elements that um, are, in fact, well-known elements of art. We've got lines, marks, forms, shapes, textures, spaces. All any, th this is what's literally described as falling into a piece of art. Um, so, um, so we thought, OK, let's have a class of pictorial elements. By the way, that's and, why we call them elements, because of mm -hmm. this definition which we mm -hmm. found online in a well-known online lexicon of art terms. Right. So when we split up this idea of, of um, depicting versus pictorial elements, things that are depicted versus things that are pictorial elements, 
we um, we found that we were able to say a lot of thi a lot more things. We could say actually that even though a tor an X-ray of a torso is doesn't really look like a torso, it does actually depict a torso. And but here we've got something that looks like. And now this very well may be a depiction, which I'll get to in a few minutes. But for our purposes for, for right now, this looks like a female torso. And this looks like something that's more like an iconic female torso. This might really be a person, but we don't know. Or it's maybe just a cartoon person. This is probably really a person, so she's really depicted. Um, not the hard part, but the, the female torso there. So, um, so we found that we were able to have... Um, it's, it's not really a sliding scale exactly, but there, is, there are ways that you could now fairly easily see these different categories that you could put these types of, be able to take all these different pictures of tor female torsos, for example, and put them in these different... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's actually, rather than a science scale, it's more like there's two dimensions. I mean, yeah. and, 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 and uh, we certainly hadn't, and I don't think anybody else who's designing these ontologies had done previously, is it, <laughs> what we hadn't done until we got to this point is separate out the, the, the ideas of being a depiction of in the sense of, you know, what was in front of the camera or, or what the artist was trying to make a drawing of on the one hand and something appearing like something else on the other hand. And those are really two separate ideas. So that's why we call the second one looking like, looks like. Right, depicting So depicts and looks like. like. And an ordinary photograph, the kind of things you find on a friend of a friend, are all just like mug shots of people. They always coincide. Of course it looks like the person, or you wouldn't have chosen that picture. And of course it depicts that person, otherwise there's some faking going on. So they always have coincided. But the point is they needn't. You can separate them out. And when you look at wider class images, you have to. That doesn't look at all like a torso. But it does, it's very important to know that it depicts the torso of Mrs. X Smith of patient number so-and-so. Otherwise, you know, the wrong person gets the treatment. Uh, so. Is that, is that like the, the photograph pairs of people who look like they're pets? Yeah. Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yes. We'd be able to describe yes. that. Actually. Yes, we yeah. would be able to describe that. Looks like, but yeah. doesn't depict. Yeah. Exactly. I, and I, again, and I, I'm going to just reiterate that that the that the whole idea of this is to come up with an ontology that's sort of in a sweet spot. It, it can't be heavy. We can't describe every single thing. We w but we do want to find a way to describe more than what's being described now, just by the notion of depiction alone. So, but. But we said, well, we can't, we're, we're not going to, this could be either. This could be a depiction of a torso of a female mannequin, or it could also be a pictorial element that looks like a female torso. Or In both. Fact, or both. In fact, back here, the second image could easily be, because it, it looks more like a shape of a female torso, so it could also be a looks like. And that would be okay in our, in our ontology. And you'll see why a little bit more later. So when we... The more we talked about pictorial elements and what exactly was a pictorial element in an image, in, in an image, um, or in, <laughs> um, we um, started realizing that if this top, if this top piece here, if this is just an image all by itself, forget about this one down here. If this is just an image, then. It, and it can depict someone, then that piece, that same piece inside a larger image can also um, depict that same item, which means that basically uh, the, if, if, if a part of the image can depict something and the whole image can depict something, then the whole image must also be a pictorial element. So, it also means that depiction applies to pictorial elements rather than to whole images, right. which is another change from the simple right. mugshot view of things. Right. So, so, and here's another example of that. So here's an, here, sticking with the female torso theme is, is on a, you know, here's the entire, the entire image basically looks, looks like a female torso. It's not anyone depicted, it just looks like. But here is a female torso that's actually depicted, and that's the entire image. So this is the entire pictorial element that's depicting a female torso. Okay, and so, and sticking with the same sort of theme, um, 
again, this, is, this relates to what the person doing the marking up wants to say, or the person, I mean, Picasso said many times that this is Marie Therese Walter, so, the, so we, we all may look at that and say, well, that's just a looks like a female person, but, or it looks like an abstraction of a female person, but to Picasso, that really was this person. So, so it's okay for the person who's, who's marking up their image to say that this is a depiction rather than a looking like. Pat did this torso, and he can tell you exactly who that is, and I think it's Joy, maybe, I'm not sure, but... Mm, no, um, it wasn't Joy, it was um, <laughs> Stephanie. Stephanie. And so... It, one so of our models this depicts rather group. than looks like. Now someone else might want to say it looks like, but if the person marking up says it's depiction, then it's depiction. But this, this is okay. It works for our, for our ontology. And it sounds deceptively simple, but it actually can, can do a lot functionally in the machine language. Um, okay, so we said, well, you know, not everything that's depicted in an image is that important. A lot of times you go out on Flickr and you see people that tag every single little thing that's in an image. They'll tag red and blue and, you know, candle if it's sitting on the table and they'll tag, you know, there'll be a keyword for every single thing that, that they see depicted in that picture. Well, some of those things depicted are just not really that important. So. So we created actually a property that, that, that kind of is a larger uh, property that um, larger than depicts, the notion of depicts, called shows. Meaning that everything that is, and it's a relationship between the image and the thing, meaning that everything that's depicted in the scene is theoretically shown. But depiction is a hierarchically level greater than that. Yeah, let me just emphasize that. I mean, part of the sort of, Part of the idea of making these ontological distinctions, providing this terminology in the ontology, is so that people can use it to mark up in intuitive ways. So we're constantly sort of saying to ourselves, well, would you sort of, would you want to say this kind of thing? And, and what you, the, the sort of strict philosophical notion of depiction is the one in which, you know, in the picture is depicted. Everything. It's just a blade of grass under, you know, under the guy's foot. When you take a portrait of someone standing in a meadow, that blade of grass is depicted because it's in the picture. But that isn't what people say intuitively. If you say to them, what's this a picture of? They don't mention the grass. Right. They mention the person. Maybe they mention. If you push them, they'll say, well, there's some trees. But they don't mention every single thing in the picture. So we wanted to provide a sort of two-level classification here. It's like, all right, stick to it. You know, this depicts the car, maybe, the people, sure. Uh, it depicts that building if you're interested in the building. Maybe it depicts the trees, but no one's going to say it depicts that ventilation shaft, you know. But it does show that. But it's, it's in the picture. And it might matter, you know, I don't know, a building survey might say, did that house have a survey shaft? Why oh, was it, it was in that picture over there, let's go and check. So we, we, we introduced shows as a sort of second, what's the word? Second rate uh, version of depicts. So you have a kind of two level classification. So you can talk about things that things a picture of using depicts, and you can just mention all the other crud using shows. So there's no real philosophical justification for that distinction, but it seemed to correspond to intuitions that people have when they talk about what pictures are pictures well, of. And I, I don't at all mean to jump the gun or anything, but do you capture anything sort of more holistic, like the Dolly thing is an acid trip or? melting reality or... Oh, we do. Well, oh, absolutely. We, we do, we do, but that's not exactly what we're trying to do with the ontology at this point. We do have a notion of convey. Uh, you're jumping ahead. Yeah. Wait, we'll is, get to it. Yeah, we're getting to that. We do have a notion of conveys because there is another... Again, we're trying to link up with other data that's already out there on the web. There's, there's in DBpedia and in another um, ontology called um, uh, SCOS, which is Simple Knowledge Ontology System, then we have, a, um, we, we have this notion of conveys, which can convey something like, okay, this conveys a metaphor for the passage of time, or this convey, you know, I mean, that's, that's a bit of an extreme example. Or but conveying yeah, a mood, like con sadness. A mood, so conveys actually represents the things that are a little bit more subjective. So, but we have this three-tiered kind of system for what is showed, what is shown, what is depicted, and what, and what a subject is. So getting back to that JFK image, 
then with the ontology we can now pick subject and subject is is functional in this ontology which means we've we've restricted it to being only one item so that so really the person doing the marking up is going to pick one thing that they most if they if they really think it has a subject this is the thing that it is the subject about while it can depict all of these other items it does have this one functional subject um, and again, it, it goes down to the person marking up the image. I mean, we had this discussion with, with Robert that, you know, well, I might not see the same things that another person might see. Well, that, that's, of course, obviously true. But what, what we have is on one end, someone marking it up, and on another end, trying to search for it. And if you can use the ontology to, be, to get a little bit more descriptive, then that's all you really need to do. That's because our notion of conveys will link up to all of this other data that is already out there on the web that is, is already formalized. So the more data that's formalized, the more we can link to those particular notions. So what we have to have is this very small, lightweight system that the machine can understand that will just let us separate into these very simple but sophisticated cat categories. And so this tiered system has just, I've been out there on Getty Images, which is a big commercial site for, um, for purchasing uh, commercial stock photography and done a lot of research in this. And they have an awful lot of items out there that are where if it's got, in fact, I have an image down here later in the slideshow that's like, I mean, they'll list, they list everything. They list 150 different things. If it's got a blade of grass in it, they'll put grass. So who knows how it ranks when they're searching to come up with these things. So, so we split this up into this idea of shows and depicts a main subject and then things that are, can, can be conveyed um, by, by the image. Um, so I only put this back in there just to point out about the, the ventilator. Okay, so something else that was exciting about these, um, these pictorial elements is that we picked out a picture like this, this um, Keith Haring image. And um, we said, okay, well these are pictorial, let's call these pictorial elements. They look like, for example, an iconic heart. They look like an iconic you know, human figure. IHMC's logo is an iconic you know, running man. Um, they, um, we said, okay, if we can, we can describe this as having you know, all of these um, pictorial elements that are um, described, I mean, that, that look like these shapes. And I think, did you want to add something about that? Yeah, I just wanted to point out, I mean, there's a sort of, this is an interesting place here. It, it, where, where the ontology technology, the, or technology is the wrong word, the, the sort of philosophy behind the ontology language idea doesn't quite get, uh, get to where we want it to be. And it's kind of interesting because, um, I mean, we want to say this looks like a heart. Well, it doesn't cost a little like a heart. You ever see an actual heart? You know, yeah. <laughs> an, an individual particular heart? It don't look like that, you know? That's a sort of like a heart icon or something like that. Um, but even, even if, it, so there's an issue of what, what's the difference between an actual thing and an iconic thing, right? Um, but there's also an issue of, we were, supposing, it, we were, supposing we accepted that this, that this is, you know, never mind the iconicity, but this looks like a person. But in the ontology world, if you say that, then you're, you're saying there is an actual person, a particular person, probably with a name and a social security number, that this looks like. Because you're talking about the individuals. And of course, you don't mean that. You mean it looks like a sort of, it's sort of person-shaped. It looks like a kind of typical person. And in the ontology world, there's no such thing as a typical X. There's just Xs. And then there's classes of X, you know, like all people. But that's a category, right? There's all elephants. And, and there isn't any, and this has come up in a number of other domains in, in the ontology world. So how do you talk about, you know, uh, the typical African elephant? You know, African elephants are typically larger than Indian elephants, right? But, I mean, that, does that mean that the typical African elephant is bigger than the typical Indian elephant? Or is, is it a statistical statement? Or yada, yada. But, it's, you know, these sort of difficulties confront us in the face when we try to sort of deal with, with things like this. Because images are full of iconic or sort of typical <laughs> things like the running man. So one idea we had, so it's just a little bit of technical stuff here, is that we could say that, this, that it looks like the class, the actually category, 
course, that doesn't make sense. You can't look like a category. But we could use that as a convention to convey this idea that it was a typical member. But it turns out that would break, those of you who know what I'm talking about, that would, that would, you'd be an owl fool if you did that, because it would break owl DL reasoners, and, and most of the reasons out there are owl DL. Um, so that would be a kind of technical no-no. Another thing we could do, which actually, I don't know if you've even seen this, I put this on the slide mm, this did. morning. Yeah. Um, we could say that it was like the concept of a heart. Mm -hmm. And you might think, how the hell can you say that? And the answer is that there's this existing ontology called SCOS, stands for Simple Knowledge Organization System, that's already out there in the linked data world, that has the notion of a concept of a thing in it. So you can point to something and say in SCOS and say, I'm the, con I'm the concept of that. And now you can refer to me. Right? right? Where that can be a heart, or the class of hearts, or whatever. So it distinguishes between concepts of things and actual things. So, so you can sort of refer to an idea. Now, it's not clear that they intended it to be used this way when they developed that. And I've spoken to some of the people who did it, right, at, at uh, the Semantic Web uh, mm -hmm. meeting. Um, and I don't think they did intend it to be used that way, but we could use it that way. But I go into this, just at this point, just to emphasize just how sort of fluid a lot of these decisions are right now. Because all of this stuff, it's like walking on jelly. Nothing is set yet. You know, there, all those three billion linked data, almost every term used in every one of them, its meaning is still just a little bit up for negotiation. Right. And it really will be determined finally by the way the whole damn planet sets in its use of these terminologies. So doing something like this is a high risk move. If everybody, if you do it in public and people recognize and think, neat idea, and they copy you, then you have just created a meaning for the planet. Right. If they don't copy you, your, your history. So it's a high risk maneuver, and I haven't, we haven't decided what to do about that. Anyway. Okay. Uh, uh, why can't it, if, you, if, you, if that's your reasoning, why can't it be called those, those humanoid figures? Why can't they be called, for instance, an icon of a person? They could, they but then we'd have to explain what an icon is to people. Right. I mean, that might be the best way to go. That would be the most honest and way to go. It's, yeah. to say, it's just to sort of bite the bullet and say, look, these things are icons. You all out there, if you're going to use our ontology, you've got to understand what we mean by an icon, roughly, and use it consistently. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's a perfectly honest thing to do. I was sort of try, I guess I was interested in sort of quick hacks that would avoid having to do that okay. and, and the risks associated. But you're absolutely right, Greg. Probably we will need to do that, actually. Well, I thought icons are very loaded words. Yeah. It is. Oh, oh, it is. The yeah. words are all loaded yeah. as hell. That's why you have to document what you mean. I, mean, I, I bring in concepts like uh, caricature. Right. And so you can, you can have icons that are depictions, especially religious icons. You're supposed to be I know, I know. And you can have depictions of things that are iconic. Right. I know, I know. I photograph well, we the Mickey Mouse of, sign. I mean, we I do even. have a way of actually dealing with that. I mean, we have a way of, especially when we get down to user interface ideas of being able to to allow the, again, it has to do with who's doing the, the marking up, so, and who's doing the searching. What are the yeah. category of Elvis impersonator? That would cover all. <laughs> 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 okay, on another, on another, on another. Um, back to the easy stuff back for to a the, second. Yeah, for, for a second. This is actually uh, just kind of a side note of interest, and we didn't correct that spelling on that slide. Anyway, um, <laughs> we, um, it, uh, when we started trying to define this image, uh, we start. We, you know, we looked at it and said, "Okay, here's another great image by Pat." Um, uh, Pat was calling this a depiction of a particular model, but all of the area, and it pretty much exp explains it here. All of the the actual area that represents the reclining nude is actually defined by the outline. So. Uh, it's just a notion that, as we already said, pictorial elements can have space. We don't want to say that the outline depicts. I don't want to say that, that the outline depicts. It's just, right, I want to say the actual white space that the outline outlines depicts. Depicts. But that's nothing. It's white space. <laughs> so we have to allow that to be a pictorial element. Pictorial elements are not just marks or patches. Mm -hmm. They're actually also going to be negatives. They can be implied by other things. Right. 
Okay, so uh, and this is an example of what the what the code would look like for that. So. Right. So if yeah. we've got that distinction, by the way, this actually uses the concept of a linear pictorial element, mean as opposed to a line, as opposed to a patch, and this an implicit as the white space, as opposed to explicit, an actual mark. Uh, if you've got those two distinctions, then you could define this defines in OWL the um, Union. the, uh, the de it's the, the def OWL definition of line drawing. Right. Um, a, a, which is a, an image, all of whose um, uh, visual parts are um, either implicit or lines. In other words, the only, the only marks are linear. So you, you can, and you can, you, know, you, could, you could define things like red line drawing or, you know, or you, there's a whole bunch of sort of things you could, you can build up descriptions now that are, you know, somewhat non-trivial right. in terms of how they characterize the image. Right. I mean, we're not, we're not saying, by the way, that we can do everything with our ontology. No, no, no. We're not, this is not the scope of our project at this point. We're only trying to get a little nugget that is a little bit better than what is already exists. So... Um, here's an example where looking at this herring image, when I, I found this herring image, of, of, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and then I tried to find it again. I don't know, I didn't save it or whatever, so I, I was trying to find it again. Well, going back to herring's um, catalogs on a herring website, the only way to look through his, his works or to go by year, and I have no idea when he created this image, um, I, I, I don't really know that much about Keith Haring's work. I do know I'm looking for a picture with a red heart in the center on a white background, basically. That's the way I'm describing it in my head, the way I would want to search for that. Well, naturally, I can't find that as it stands right now, looking through any kind of Google image search. But you know, if, and, and we've now added this concept of having, a, having pictorial backgrounds, which can be all white, or having depicted backgrounds. Because the depiction here, and I mean in this case, uh, in the picture of the Blue Angels, the background is not really that significant. But again, if you were looking at a Flickr picture of this, it would be tagged, you know, Blue Angels, Jets, you know, Formation maybe, whatever, a whole list of things, and it would have sky, and generally people will write sky and clouds, okay, things like that when they're tagging. And, um, if, you, if, we're just, if we're simply able to have the notion that images can have a background, that adds a whole lot to being able to find things. So if I, if using our, we would be able, using our ontology, for me to find that image of the Keith Haring, being able to say I'm looking for a, the one with the red heart and the white background. I mean, the so, other thing you might not know, unless you happen to be really interested in Keith Haring, is that white backgrounds are rather unusual in his work. Most of his paintings are done on colored grounds. So this happens to be a very salient feature for, for finding it, but there's no way to use it as a point of view. For, for months, I've been trying to find an image, a Dali image online, that is a line drawing of a head uh, that looks like it's unwrapping. And, there's, and I've been unable to find that just by doing Dali searches, using all, any number of potential search terms. But using our ontology, we would be able to find that because we could say, well, it looks like a head. I mean, it, provided it were marked up in that way. Um, so here's, and here's another example. Um, this, again, we have the blue angels. We have my cat who's named Angel. And then we have um, this, this image that has an area that to some people looks like an angel. <laughs> okay. It doesn't matter whether you actually believe that or not. It, again, it's, 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 if somebody wanted to say it looks like an angel, they could. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, there's two levels right. of belief here. You Just, can believe it looks like an angel, and you and can believe people, it depicts an angel. Some, some people believe it depicts an angel, an angel, which is right. a whole other game. But, but you know, there's even a lot of um, machine um, techniques for combining images, uh, for, I mean, combining keywords in Flickr, for example, and looking at the word uses and pairing up all of the different combinations of the words. And in a lot of those cases, they ignore 
um, personal pronouns. They ignore things that are capitalized. They also, um, there's some things they just can't get. They, they, can, they can figure out the word sense in a lot of cases. And they have a pretty, you know, but it, it depends on what all they're comparing yeah, in, those, yeah. in these tag lists. So, but this is something that our ontology would be able to do. We would be able to say, I mean, you know, and it doesn't even really matter. Again, the subjective parts don't really matter. Does somebody want to say it's a specific formation? Does somebody want to say it conveys military power? That's okay. They can say all of that. But just having this separated notion of pictorial elements versus depiction um, and versus shows, you know, because clouds and sky here are not important to the image of the cat. They're just... Um, it happened to be in the cat. I mean, somebody might think they were important, but to be but to be able to search on this, that would that would do something like that. The main yeah. point is that if if at the moment, basically, all you get are keywords, and you'll get angel and you'll get cloud and all of these, and that's all you get. And just even a little bit of structural description is is going to should produce a lot of bang for the buck in terms of right. retrieval, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you see the difference between has depicted background and shows? There has depicted background and shows. There's not, it, it, there's not really a, I mean, it, it has to do with what you want to. Uh, I mean, the, the, if it has a depicted background, then that background is shown, yes. But, it, right. it, it, well, even maybe not that. It could well be that the, there is no thing in the sense of a thing depicted, which would count as the whole background. You might, you might, you're not obliged to put any of this information in, remember. These are all just optional description tools you have. But if you, if you want to say the background of this is clouds, or if you want to say, for example, that in the case of the Dali, that there are mountains in the background in the scene. I mean, I would say everything you could, that's depicted you could say in the background that without is also shown. necessarily saying they were shown. And yeah. you can also say that something was shown without saying where in the picture it was shown. Right. Well, I would so, say everything that's in a depicted background is also shown. Yeah. I mean... It doesn't hurt to say that. That's probably true, yeah. although our ontology doesn't require it at the moment. Right. So this is the ontology so far, which kind of actually it does meet the requirements of being a lightweight ontology. It, and um, uh, is there anything you want to add about this picture? Um, there's a missing inverse link between these two. Right. And Tom knows why it's missing. <laughs> I couldn't get Pico to draw the damn thing, that's all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, oh, there's a few things on the ontology that we didn't really explain yet, and I'll explain them in the next slide. This, this work versus facsimile of, and, or, well, the property of facsimile of between image and work. And that basically says that, um, um, you know, a lot of people put a lot of weight into that word work. They think, oh, well, did you create a work or a work of art? Well, it, you know, the, we're not putting that kind of heavy thing on it. We're just saying if you have some image that you've created, whether it exists, in a digital domain or whether it exists outside of that uh, in the physical world, then, and, and you may be doing something else with it. Pat's piece here of a simple chalk drawing here, he might not ever want to do anything like that. He's not going to call that a work of art, so to speak. I mean, it, it, right. you know, it might become a work of art one day. Who knows? Too late. But it doesn't really matter. Oh, did you already went over it? Yeah, <laughs> okay. But at that moment, it was, a, it was a work versus an image. And the image just means basically the identity on the internet. The, the image is, is the actual piece, the actual file that information is attached to. So we had to differentiate between whether when you're talking about an image, whether it is the real, whether it uh, really exists as a separate entity or what is actually the file name, um, the file that exists on the internet. And so right. we said if you have this, so for example, that top image, you know, would be a work. Um, and the image that we're talking about on the internet is a facsimile of that work. 
So, I mean, the, re the real thing that got this was that one of the very first existing vocabularies that we we found kind of as an inspiration is that it's not actually semantic web oriented. It's not part of the linked data world. It's just a big standardized vocabulary. But it's been very well worked on and thought through by a large number of people in a large number of museums. And I'm saying this because I'm desperately trying to remember the, the acronym and I can't. Anyway, it's, it's designed for use VRA. by... It's a VRA. The VRA, yeah. that's right. Uh, by, by museum curators for maintaining catalogs and, and curation records of works of things in museums. And it's huge. And almost the only image-oriented thing in it is depiction, <laughs> as always. Everybody starts with depiction. And an idea we got from it, actually, was that you can depict mythical things, as in the Dali. That depiction doesn't have to always be of real things in the world. But all the rest of that vocabulary is about things like the, 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 what school the artist was working in, where the work was created, what it weighs, uh, how much is it worth, what its dimensions are, you know, what medium is it, is it done on canvas or on board, or etc. All about the actual physical thing. Right, the thing that the museums have to worry about and, and not get wet and, and, and uh, not scratch. Right? And of course, all our images are digital images. So that contrast was sort of forced on us very, very um, vividly Early at the on. beginning. We had to make this distinction between the Mona Lisa and you know, my photo of the Mona Lisa. Um, and then we need a relation between them. And we decided on this facsimile of, which I'm, you know, uh, we decided to call it facsimile. We don't want to say that this um, depicts this. It's right. Right, because that's, a, I mean, you could, if I take a photograph of the Mona Lisa very carefully and make a very nice, neat copy of the Mona Lisa and digitize it on a website, you could say, I've got a depiction of the Mona Lisa. And in a sense, that's true, but that's not the same notion, truly same sense of depiction as the one we've been using for, you know, the picture of my Uncle Joe or the picture of the people in standing in the, looking at the car. But if you have, if you, have you standing next to the Mona Lisa, then you yeah, can, the image is exactly. that the Mona Lisa is depicted in so, it. And in fact, it can even be that some, a depiction of a work of art might be higher resolution than a facsimile of it. So a really high quality photograph taken in a museum that just happens to have a beautiful picture of the Mona Lisa in one corner, right, it could be a depiction because it's a photograph of the museum. Uh, and a rather low-grade thumbnail intended to sort of just be a little illustration on a website, only you know a few hundred pixels, could be a facsimile because it's really only intended to reproduce the image poorly. So this is the notion of sort of reproduction rather than a photograph of. Right. That was one of the early distinctions, conceptual distinctions that took us a while to get clear. Well, that's, that's the, this is not a pipe. Right. No, that's really to do with reference. This is a picture of a pipe as opposed to being a pipe, right? Well, right. a painting depicts a pipe. Yes, a and painting the depicts. The wording underneath it is making the point. Yes. It's not a pipe. Yes, 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 that's right. absolutely right, 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 right. But then that would be true here and here for us. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, basically, that is our, ontol our beginning of our ontology is roughly right. published here if we could get Perl to work right. It has a, a permanent URL, which is the access point to it. I've been having problems with a lot of pearls lately. <laughs> <laughs> it's considered very good ma poor manners to not have a pearl for your linked right. ontology. Uh, I don't think, that's really, the, the rest of the slides that we have are, are kind of just su supporting um, things. They're yeah, I think really, that's, we've got to the end of the talk. This is basically really. the end of the, but, of the um, talk. So. so, questions? <laughs> Any observations? <laughs> cool. Uh, I know, I think, that Google orders the things you get when, when it, you know, when it orders them in terms of the match between what terms people use and which thing they go to first when they get them. Mm -hmm. oh, it, it, it's yeah. It's I, I mm -hmm. gather actually. I just read an article about this. It's very yeah. complex, but that's basically what. The same thing could be true here. You sort of seed the thing, and something like that over time would sort of sort out what people mean. What they. I don't know. I I, I mean I've tried using it's, that. I mean I've tried looking at those algorithms yeah. and, ex, and tr exploring whether that would work or not. And and I don't think it would work as well as the ontology. I mean well, over I'm not, time. I'm not talking about the ontology. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. about people's fumbling around trying to 
Oh, right. right. Oh, yeah. Well, we, the user interface idea that we have actually yes. sorts out a lot of that, and especially with Tom's Tom's input has been invaluable to c come up with some ideas of what, what we're building to to enlighten, to kind of cue people in on what's going to be the most the, the, the easiest, giving all kinds of you know salient clues for how to what's the best way to. What we want to do is build a user interface, and we didn't talk about this in any detail, well, we didn't mention it really, but, but this, this is on our plan, is to build a, design and build a user interface for, a te for marking up images using this ontology, which makes it very intuitive and natural for people to use and produces the markup in the ontology in a sort of standardized way. Rather than sort of saying to them, okay, off you go, get an editor, type up your RDFA or your OWL, you know, with all the angle brackets and make sure it's in XHTML and, okay. and use our ontology. I mean, can, people won't do that, we know that. Oh, well, some people will, but they're the people who go to the conferences. The people in the, I mean, the artists mm -hmm. won't do that. So we need a, we need a, we need a, a user-friendly interface that lets we people mark up images naturally not by marking them up, by sort of saying things about them they want to say. And, and we're in the process of thinking hard about designing that, yeah. This is the, this is a markup of, of the image that yeah, this Pat is, has of the reclining This nude. is the kind of markup you'll get from And that. this is a XHTML plus RDFA this is that, that, sleep, that, that red drawing of the sleeping nude. And, right. and then we can actually, I mean, this is quite interesting. Already out there in existing linked data, there are, well, where do It shows that. Right. It shows. But could, bring it back a second. There are the concepts of nude person, adult female human, and reclining posture. Right. We didn't have to invent those. They're out there already. We linked to them. So there's a lot of quite remarkably sort of intuitive, natural terminology already out there being used that we can link to. Which is one of the, you know, we, we don't have to do it all ourselves. We just have to provide the ways of connecting to all this. That's part of the problem. Right. But when you describe your user interface that you're talking about, who's the user? Are you talking about the creator of the image? Someone who, the generally, generally, generally speaking, the creator although, of the image. Although an art critic could mark up an entire gallery of, of images from the Rijksmuseum, or I, I mean, if someone who know, you know, who it's whoever's really compelled to want to mark up the image. Right, but it's at the it's, it's at that end, not at the consumer end, not the person looking for the image. They don't right. have to do that. No, no it, the, the the person who's motivated. I mean, I was motivated. I started trying to put my images on the web in a in a in a my own online gallery back in 1992 or whatever. My first website and. I immediately st stopped after, well, gosh, if I list everything that's depicted in this scene, it's surely not going to matter much. <laughs> well, the thing you should know is that Margaret has approximately 100,000 images that she needs to mark up. <laughs> So, Mark you know, scale factors are, are, you know, we have to wait for the web. Just on her website, we've got scale factor issues. If it well, takes more than a couple of minutes each, we're There's a lot of people, though, dead. on Flickr. I mean, the Library of Congress put their catalog, put a subsection of their catalog on Flickr just to see how many people would tag it. And overnight, they had something like, I don't know, 50,000 tags. Because yeah. people, some people like to just sit around and... There are Tag astonishing crowd effects that you get. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. it, if you can get something out there, or the world can look at it. There's a lot of people out there are willing to do this kind of thing, uh, and right. voluntarily. Right. Greg. And, there, and there's that little tool where you pay people percent, little cents. Yeah, what, that's what's the, other the name thing. of the time? Uh, what is the name of it? Uh, the mechanical Turk. Yeah. yeah mechanical yeah, yeah. Turk. Right. There's also a game that you do with that too. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Have you ever tried playing it? The clairvoyance game. Yeah. yeah. It, it's it's boring as dirt. It's boring. People play that but for the longest. Hours. Somebody play that for like twelve hours at a time. Though. People really get addicted to that. I, I wouldn't trust the output of anybody who could possibly do that for twelve well, hours. That's <laughs> well, true enough. Yeah, Greg. I was just wondering, like, uh, the, the, you still need this notion. I think of, of like a committee that decides then what's important to say about things because because no. How, mm -mm. no wait wait how would I search for Photographs by Margaret Warren that are that have that are very vibrant in color. I mean, I don't see any way unless somebody knows to tag them that way. No, no, but that's the point, Greg. We don't we don't know right. He, the, if you're doing it through tagging, then you have to rely on the searcher and the tagger using the same word right. or very closely related words. 
um, we're not trying or to word solve combination. that problem. We think actually. it's far more. It's far more likely. It's far more likely if if you to happen if you give people vocabularies they can make structured descriptions in. Now it's not guaranteed, Any the search is never going to be guaranteed, right? You're never, you're never going to be guaranteed of a match. But all the experience of leaked data so far is that even a little bit of structured description is way better than nothing. Way better, right? Even if you could just combine words in pairs with, with linking phrases just to make simple phrases. So if you could decompose vibrant into some description using simpler terminology that was that even had a more than ch slightly more than chance likelihood of being used by both people, then you're way ahead of the game. And that's where we're trying to get. But you to. can't do that now. Like I mean, you can't go into libraries and say something like that. I mean, like you can't say, well, I want all the book. I mean, you can. You, you, yeah, maybe you've had a committee that has come up with certain classification. You know, it, it, using a taxonomy. And there are people out there who, are, who have taxonomies for, you know, controlled vocabularies for describing images. In fact, well, Melissa just left, but, you know, the uh, Reuters news agency, they have, they, and they even have some machine tagging that, mm. that will take, take a term like ambulance uh, and then they'll it it will automatically add on emergency worker yeah. or some t some it, sort it, of it, tag like that. Like the machine will add that on. So see, we're not exactly trying to solve that problem. I mean, I mean, it's still though, if I'm not mistaken, it still is the case. So it's sort of the equivalent of people who complain that you know uh, this program forces the user to think a different way in order to be able to use the program. It's sort of the same thing, right? You have to. You have to learn the vocabulary. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, this, no, this enough, is more like a visual. Once you see it, you kind of. No, no but, but he's right. He's right. right. I mean, yeah. it does require that there's some some discoverable correlation between yeah, right. the way the searcher is describing it and the person right. who tagged it. Very heavily on the notion of intuitive description. Yes, we do. That are we indeed, and in, and you know that itself is almost certainly, for example, culturally dependent, and and right. I mean, also also other dependencies. Right. Yes. Consensus. Yeah. Right. And it's very very testable, right? So we know from ample psychological research that you can bring somebody into a laboratory, sit them down, and show them something on the order of one thousand slides of works of art, two seconds each, and then bring them back the next day and give them a recognition test, and they'll do about ninety percent. Yeah, correct, that's right. Right. So bring mark up. Thousand of those 50 million, right? Bring somebody in, sit them down, show them three seconds each, bring them back the next day, and say, uh, search and find, think of one that you saw, and then search on it, and just see what words they use. And if it if it matches, that's a good idea. If, mm -hmm. it, matches, if, it's, if, if it matches the your intuitions about depict looks like. Oh, so yesterday, did you see any images that depicted reclining nudes? Right. Mm. Well. Go, f go find right. one that, that comes to mind and see what happens. Right. That's, kind of, that's kind of getting a little bit of scans. I mean, a lot of mm -hmm. the questions that, that have been asked here, good it's idea. not coming out with the right description. I'm sure. It's coming out with a description from the perspective of the image maker. Right. A lot of the things that, that like like the, um, uh, the, the Picasso or who was mm -hmm. the, the, the... Yeah, Marie Therese Walter. Yeah. yeah. The, Marie Therese. I mean, for him, that was a depiction. And right. He was adamant about that. Right. Nobody else would say it. Well, actually, if you ever see a photograph of her, you'd recognize it from that painting. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I like to use this example on something. Like, here's, a search, here's a search on uh, the symbols.com, which I love. If you're trying to find any kind of bizarre symbol, you know, you've got all these different ways you can look at it the, the, versus the symmetry, the, whether it's an open or closed shape, and whether the shape is curved. So, are you talk, to find something? Yeah, anyway, I, I mean, I think this is, if, if with, with something like our ontology, you can... What would you like? Uh, choose, yeah. choose. You want it single like axis symmetric? Arrow. Yeah. Triple. Multi-axis. Multi-axis Multi symmetric? Yes, yes. Okay, you want open or closed? Yes, sir. Open, okay. <laughs> Curved or? Straight. 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 All right, good. And uh, do you want crossing lines or non-crossing lines? Crossing. Yeah. Crossing is much more interesting, absolutely. Let's see what we get. Eh. See, I'm a Mac person. There you go. That's a few of them. That's just what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, I mean, I, I think this is a fascinating site. It kind of gives the difference between what I think that the equivalent sort of visually that our, that our ontology can do is that once the user kind of has an idea of, of being able to say, well, wait a minute, I'm, you know, back to that image of the, of the torsos, the different varying degrees of torsos, torsos. whether it's depictions or looks like. And sure, you can say they're both. You can easily say they're both. And then that, if that's the case, you're not doing much more than just tagging it. But that's OK, because if someone actually has been able to, to select something that's more like a, 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 a looks that is more like looking like versus more like, you know, and even if they, if they do a search and they get back a lot of examples and say, that's not at all what I was looking for. I want something that isn't a real torso. I want something that looks more like, you know, that, that's a drawing then that's going to fall under. And then you don't have to really worry about whether it's a, whether it's a cartoon or you know, whether it's a stick figure or, or 